Uh, my name is Werner Meyer. I'm the chapter chairman here. And uh, I'd like to thank Gary Klein, our judging chairman, for arranging. Uh, I think it's going to be a great session this afternoon. We've got Dave McClellan here, a retired uh, chief engineer, the guy that succeeded uh, 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 Zora Duntoff. And uh, he, he, I've heard him speak a number of times, and it's, uh, I'm astounded every time at how, how knowledgeable this man is. And accompanying him is his new bride, Joanna. So, hey. Just recently married last month. All right. So, uh, okay. really uh, appreciate everybody uh, coming out today. Uh, you can see we kind of have an overflow crowd here, but that's great. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Dave McClellan come with us, like Warner said, former chief engineer from General Motors and uh, one of the most iconic Corvette people that I, I have the uh, ability to know. And Dave's going to talk to us today on, uh, obviously, Corvettes. So uh, he really doesn't need much more introductions than Dave. It's all yours. Well, good afternoon. A um, couple things before I get started on the presentation. Uh, Joanne and I were married the 16th of January at Ooh. Disney World, and it turned out to be an NCRS wedding because our wedding planner, Ed Augustine, who runs the Florida Sun and Fun meet. These are oh, cool? Fun and Sun t-shirts, or <laughs> sweatshirts. And uh, the preacher was NCRS uh, Alan Foster as well. <laughs> we, got, we got married on a, uh, a fancy pontoon boat out in the middle of one of the lakes at Disney World. Uh, in the evening, it was dark, and the wedding then was by flashlight. And right after the wedding, the fireworks. We uh, uh, had a great time. Joanna is a master's in double E uh, from Georgia Tech, so she's a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. <laughs> and a heck of an engineer. So we do a lot of engineer talk. Um, also, my car, 9501. Uh, it's finished now. It's sitting over in Illinois uh, at uh, Mark Habeck's shop. We're going to bring it back when we have a little warmer weather. And uh, it's, uh, it's been gone through. Um, he says it's at 530 horsepower, which is not bad. Um, he, he redid the intake system, um, took the engine out of the car, I don't think, he, well, he didn't do any bottom end work, but it was all top end work. And then aluminum flywheel, uh, 410 axle, um, a, a bypass exhaust system, what else? Those are the big, oh, and headers. So uh, that it should be uh, uh, a, a very different car than, uh, than it was when he started. But I, what I thought I would do here is talk about mid-engine Corvettes, because that's been an undercurrent for as long as anybody can remember. It goes back into the, uh, the, the fog of history. And I'm convinced that up until this point, we've never done a mid-engine Corvette, because the sales guys remembered um, the, the uh, trouble they had selling 53, 54, 55 Corvettes. And you'd never know that today, but those cars were a, a, a drug on the market. Uh, they couldn't get rid of them. And they, they actually canceled the Corvette with a few 55s that they built, um, uh, hoping that, it would, that this problem would just all go away. And uh, they have this uh, residual, they had this residual memory and uh, uh, with the 56 and on, it started. To, the car started to come back, and uh, the, the formula that, that my predecessor Zora Duntoff gave them for you know, what is a Corvette was working, and they didn't want to mess with that. And I don't think they understood the car very well, and so when you've got something that's working right, you leave it alone. And uh, when I uh, took the job of chief engineer Corvette in 75, one of the first things that uh, the uh, Chevrolet engineering bosses did was set me down and say, um, no way, McClellan, are you going to support 
any of these design staff efforts toward a mid-engine Corvette. <laughs> they had already done a number of mid-engine uh, concept cars, mid-engine Corvette concept cars. <clears throat> and so, you know, I, I understood the, the rules of the game. Um, Zora um, could, could uh, I think from about 60, oh, late 60s on, uh, his head was all in mid-engine Corvettes and he retired at the end of 74. Um, so when I would talk to Zora after he retired, and I was now doing his job, he would say, Dave, you must do the mid-engine Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> and I never did. Um, I, I had a few opportunities where we got close, but I could, I could never get styling in myself uh, I could never get styling to agree to do it when I thought it was possible to do. So we'll see if these guys today, if they've lost all their their um, um, historic memory of, of what happened in the early days, um, and and I hope they keep both cars, the front engine, front mid engine, and the rear mid engine, if that's what they're going to do. But uh, they, they've been whenever they whenever they get serious about doing something. The, the word stops. When they're not serious about doing something, you see all this stuff going on, they tell you about it, uh, and it's all just <coughs> fluff. Just, it's all smoke and mirrors. So when they get quiet, that's the time to watch out. They're up to something. Uh, in my book, I include this uh, on one of the pages. There's actually four pictures here, and I, because of the format, divided into two. This was something that, that uh, R&D was uh, proposing uh, back in the uh, uh, mid-60s. Uh, first proposal was for a, a Corvette, not unlike the one they were doing, except uh, structured differently, and they expected it to be a little bit lighter. The, the bottom picture here, proposal number two, was a lightweight front-engine car using structural steel backbone under a body with fiberglass panels that would appear as a 67. Um, they never did that either. Proposal 3 was a new uh, mid-engine car that would appear as a 67 model. So they were starting to think about what they ultimately did in the late 60s, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, this was the, the sketch of the car. They also, um, and this is Duntoff, uh, planned to we were proposing, I should say, to do a uh, mid-engine open cockpit mid, uh, car, four-wheel drive, uh, known as the Competition Grand Sport or GS3. So you can see what they were thinking about back in Chevy R&D in its great days. Mm -hmm. Chevy R&D exists no longer. Uh, physical cars that Duntoff did, the uh, Serve 1, which was uh, uh, a mid-engine car with a uh, race, uh, Indianapolis race car style <coughs> bodywork, a lot of Chevrolet components in it. Uh, you can actually see some of the suspension components uh, as just clunky old Chevrolet parts, not uh, real race car kind of parts. And they followed that with uh, with this car, Surf 2, which is a mid-engine uh, automatic transmission car. Chevy R&D was working with, uh, a little later, with uh, <laughs> Jim Hall on, uh, on what became the Chaparrales. And this particular car <coughs> had two automatic transmissions. It had one behind the engine to drive the rear wheels and another one in front of the engine to drive the front wheels. And uh, both transmissions were very different, different torque converters, um, so that uh, they, could, they could develop the kind of, of uh, performance that they wanted as a function of speed. Uh, these were not ordinary power glides. These were race <laughs> prepared transmissions. So everything about them was unique and different. Yeah, they just called them power glides. Uh, this car also still exists. And with the exhaust the way it was, it was very noisy. Yeah, this one's in a private collection down in Florida. Rick worked in this car. Yeah. Like yeah, this, I, I got the pictures out of sequence here, but this, this is actually 
Serve one looking down at the uh, engine compartment. The, the first of the mid-engine cars is a steel-bodied. Uh, uh, I would say it's more than a pro more than a concept, less than a prototype, but it was it was getting close to uh, prototype performance. Prototype is the production car off of soft tools, so it's a real production design. I don't think this car was quite there yet. Uh, what was interesting to me about the car is that in the form it was shown, and all the talk about the car was as a rear drive mid-engine car, but uh, they used a Toronado automatic transmission, and you can see in the picture that I put together here, uh, the engine is, the, the front of the car is off this way, uh, the engine is transverse just ahead of the rear axle, and the uh, torque converter, its chain drive, automatic transmission were to the side and to the front. And then uh, as a rear engine car, uh, they had to go through a 90 degree drive back to the rear differential. And uh, Zora never talked about it uh, because I think he was concerned that GM management would, would not understand. I, his plan was to, <coughs> to replace the engine with a big block and to drive uh, off of that that center differential to the front and make it a four-wheel drive car, which makes a lot of sense. So keep that in mind. Four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive. The steel-bodied car, which was also known as the New York Auto Show car, um, never uh, got GM management very excited, and I, and I don't know why. But uh, they, they never wanted to do it. Uh, when DeLorean came in as general manager of Chevrolet, he tried to figure out how can we um, make the Corvette uh, something we can afford to do. And uh, one of the ideas that he had, which was followed up on, was to make the, the car entirely out of aluminum. So this car uh, is basically the same powertrain and um, chassis system as the previous car that you saw. Uh, it's known as the Reynolds car. It still exists, with, I think, within Chevrolet or within General Motors. Um, when I was chief engineer, the car was, was uh, uh, it had been parked outside for years and uh, it was in pretty sad shape. We brought it back into R and, uh, Chevy R&D and they took it all apart repainted it, cleaned up the interior, and got it running so uh, it would be a reasonable show car. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, from stem to, stem to gudgeon, it's all aluminum. Uh, it's what NSX did many years later. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it, it was an interesting car. And then Styling also did another prototype, which is known as the Paris show car or the, um, the four-rotor Corvette, because it originally had uh, two Vonkel engines, because in the mid-70s we were starting to do, well, late, early 70s, uh, under Ed Cole as the president of General Motors, we were doing uh, a Vonkel engine program. Um, the Vonkel engine was supposed to replace all the, ultimately, all the engines that, that GM was building. Uh, the day that Ed retired, uh, I think it was like January 1st, 1975, uh, the Vonkel program was closed down and all the parts scrapped. Uh, <clears throat> it didn't work. GM didn't know how to make a Vonkel engine. Mazda barely knows how to make a Vonkel engine, but they, they have finally learned, I think. Um, and and it, it turns out not to have been uh, the the the, uh, the great savior of uh, engines that they thought it might be, that, but that's another discussion. Um, the uh, four rotor car was actually, in many ways, uh, the precursor of the uh, '84 Corvette, uh, even though the, the '84 is a front engine, front mid engine car. The uh, the, the cross sections and a lot of the, the detailed designs were done by the same designer, Jerry Palmer, and carried forward into the uh, what became the C4 
uh, Corvettes. Interesting problem they caused themselves to, uh, to, to get in the car, you had to get in under the door. Um, and a six footer, if you can imagine, is standing about midway of that door. So you got to get your head down and under and around uh, before you can get in the car. And the way they, uh, way, the way they did that, uh, you can't roll the window down. So you are in an enclosed car. And, and it wouldn't work as a convertible, you can well see. When we did the ZR1 with uh, Lotus, there was also a program to do a twin turbo uh, LT5 engine at Lotus, sponsored by Chevrolet, and uh, they built two show cars. Uh, th this is the, the version that has an all bubble canopy, and uh, Dick Baldick in uh, Chevy R&D uh, was responsible for managing the car, and uh, he was he was. Uh, not enamored with that first car because it was a design staff effort. It had no ride travel, it had no headroom, and so he, he over time was able to modify it and build a second car, uh, the blue car. And uh, uh, I actually got a drive in that at Lotus, um, driving it around their test track, which is a, an old B-17 uh, from World War II um, uh, road system. Uh, one of the rear wheel hubs failed, and uh, we came to a screeching halt. But it, it did not damage the car too badly. And I think it was this car that was being dropped, uh, uh, one of these, these uh, two-story lift um, trailers, and it was on the, on the upper level, and it was back on the, uh, on the lift, and the lift broke. And so it went crashing down onto the ground and, and it busted it up pretty badly. Uh, it, it's been since I think rebuilt. Uh, you know the pictures that are out today of what does what does a mid-engine Corvette look like? Um, it, it, this is uh, artist uh, wild rendition. Um, this is what it actually looks like. Look at the proportions of this car. It's very uh, mm -hmm. Lamborghini-like. The only way I can describe it. The you can see the door cut line to the front wheel, uh, very tight there. The windshield comes forward almost to the front wheel center line. It has a very short front overhang, and it's got a long back with the the tires, the wheels basically at the corners. <coughs> An interesting comparison, having just said what I did, is if you look at the Ford GT against the C7, um, the form of the cars is very similar. The, if you look at the length of the hood, you look at the windshield angle, the slope to the rear, um, the, the, there's a little more lift at the back of the Corvette. The, the Ford GT falls off a little bit faster. And the, the front wheels on the Corvette are further forward than they are on the GT. The GT, uh, your, your uh, driver's left foot, wants to be where that wheel is. So there's a big wheelhouse intrusion that, that the Corvette does not have. So the, the point I would make is that, that there's a, there's a mid-engine uh, sports car, Ford GT, there's the Corvette. Um, there's not that much difference between them in terms of proportions and shape. Uh, then it comes down to details of, of styling, this differentiation between them. Okay. Um, let me open it to questions that you might have. Thanks, Gary. Great job. I'm really glad to see these changes that might inspire me to get a car judged again. Yeah. <laughs>